Tim here from the Australian Centre for Ancient DNA. Uh, today we're going to talk about something in the field. We're in the field at the moment, we're in the Yukon Territory, Canada. For the past couple of days we've been uh, visiting various mine sites that have cut into the permafrost. And uh, we've found frozen bones in them, which uh, means that the DNA in the bones is going to be very well preserved. We hope. So our goal is now to sample the bones, which means to just take a small portion, enough for us to work on, and leave the rest of the bone for the paleontologists who actually work in the area and are the real heroes of Pleistocene research in Canada here. Uh, we want to leave enough of the uh, bones for them to work with effectively. Setting up a sampling regime for ancient DNA requires a lot of different considerations. You're basically uh, looking for a trade-off between different factors. One of the most important of these is going to be contamination, because if it so happens that, for example, I contaminate the sample and later we sequence it, uh, we may confuse some of my DNA for the DNA of the sample and get, a, um, get an incorrect result. Uh, of course, other forms of contamination can come from the environment, where there's, there's pollen, for instance, in the air, or just ubiquitous airborne DNA, which can contaminate a sample, even if I so much as breathe on it. And then we have to think about contamination between samples. But then this is a trade-off, right? So we can also consider other things, such as we can bleach the surfaces of the samples before they go to the laboratory, which will help to remove any DNA that lands on the surface. And once they're in there, we can even take the surface off using some kind of grinder or a Dremel drill. So that reduces the need to, uh, to worry about contamination at this stage, although it's still important to be as clean as we can in a DNA sense. Contaminating the samples uh, has further effects than just confusing contaminant DNA for endogenous DNA. Uh, the fact is that uh, it's going to go into a laboratory where we work on a great deal of different samples, including human samples. So if I contaminate the DNA, there's a chance that I could affect other people's projects as well. Now one of the other parts of the trade-off is, as I mentioned before, the bones are frozen and that preserves the DNA very well. And the more time they spend unfrozen, the more the DNA has a chance to degrade and reduce the quality of the information we can later get from it. So what I'm going to actually do today in today's uh, sampling is optimise for unfreezing because there are ways that we can, we can reverse uh, any kind of minor surface contamination that I introduce to the bones or even cross-contamination between the bones, but there's very little way to reduce um, to reduce the damage that can be done if I let the bones unthaw. So we'll be concentrating largely on that. So here we are at the field camp where we set up our sampling area. Now because we're trying to be as fast as possible in processing these samples in order so they don't unfreeze, I've got to have a system in place already so that I can get them straight out of the freezer and then identify the part of the bone that I want to sample, uh, remove it using the tools, and then we have to photograph the sampled section of the bone along with the whole bone for reference purposes later and get, uh, get the sample back into the freezer as quickly as we can. I'm stealing this. <laughs> Preparation is everything. <laughs> mask will also stop me getting too much bone powder in my lungs, which we imagine is a bad thing. Alfoil lets us uh, get a new surface for each sample to reduce the cross-contamination and also reduces the static so bits of bone don't jump around. We've pre-labeled the sample bag so we can work quickly between samples. It doesn't hurt to try to clean the tools in between with a bit of uh, bleach, which destroys GNA very effectively. Show the world what you have Okay, we're ready to the freezer. Here are a collection of samples that I took frozen out of the permafrost, and this is the last one of the day. So, this is frozen, it's actually cold, and you can see frost in there, and we're going to work quite quickly so that we keep it that way. 
First thing I do is identify what part of the bone I have to sample. Uh, the first thing I'm thinking about is what's going to preserve DNA really well, and the other thing I'm thinking about is uh, not damaging or removing too much of the bone so that it's still useful for paleontological purposes later. To give you an example of what I'm looking for, this, this is a, an excellent example of a bone that will probably preserve DNA really well. You can see the compact tissue here is very thick, which means that bacteria and water and other things that help DNA to degrade uh, will have minimal penetration into the bone. It's a nice yellow colour. You can see there's, there's some encroaching of the surface stain into the inside, but it's very, very shallow, probably a millimetre. That's good quality. So I'll take off this end of it because that will be convenient to saw. Most researchers in this situation would use an electric Dremel drill, which is faster and more efficient and much easier. And we do have one of those, but my supervisor decided that he wanted it. So I'm here back in the 1600s with a hacksaw. There are a few people out here to whom we really owe everything. Um, one is the miners who uh, are the ones who expose the permafrost faces in their placer mines. Uh, whatever it is that you think about placer mining from an ecological or environmental or political perspective, it remains a fact that we would not have any fossils, or barely any fossils if it weren't, uh, for their cooperation and indeed their enthusiasm for, for paleontology and what they can do to help research. Uh, these are people we know, we know personally, so to people like the Schmidt family and the Johnsons, and all the, other, all the other people we've visited saying, can we uh, crawl all over your mind face? Who've been uh, really cooperative and helpful, especially with respect to safety and with advice, and uh, even with uh, useful scientific information, because these people really know the land and the environments better than anyone possibly could, because they're hands on there every day. Now, once you've sort of fell way through, these can be brittle enough to snap off like that. And that is just beautiful. So you can see here we've recovered a reasonable amount of this dense, light-coloured, compact bone. And it's, it's still freezing cold, so that will preserve DNA very much. The other group of people to whom we really owe everything in this project are the guys from Yukon Paleontology, uh, Liz and Sue and Grant Zazula, whose job it is to look after all of the paleontology and all of the paleontological finds that come out of the Yukon. Hey Sue, I appeared via the lane sauce. Oh, lane sauce. You mean science juice? And who were just excellent in uh, giving us the opportunity to come out here and use all their equipment, stay on their field camps, sleep in their trailers, eat their food. And, uh, and then at the end of it, they're giving us bones. So we do what we can to try and uh, <laughs> to try and make it easy for them, and to try and help them out, but uh, really we can't think about it. We don't have time to surface treat it with bleach, which is something that we do with a lot of other samples. Now being good scientists, we have to record that in such a way that all the other researchers who work with the bone will know and they'll know that they have to treat that with bleach before it goes into a laboratory and uh, preferably take the entire surface off. I'm going to go through IDing some of the bones I just sampled now. You'll meet Liz. I can actually hear her, I think this thing should be on so. Hey Liz! <laughs> What's this? Bones? <laughs> um, right by the humerus, the distal end, uh, left radius, the proximal end mm -hmm. of a bison. This guy is a juvenile. 